So a country, just like a human body, is always at work, even when you might not feel it or notice it. Huh? It keeps creating energy and strength or loses it huh? because it is either defending you against disease or it is taking in invasive material that causes ailments. Huh? Well, there are certain elements in your body that we can use in a similar fashion for a country. These things you must always check to ensure that you are healthy and you are able to work. And that's how a country too is. The first check, the first one, is the functioning of your blood cells. So if your lymphocytes are low, you are at a risk of getting a viral infection. But if your neutrophils are low, you are at a risk of attracting bacterial infection. So let us use the cells of the body as a country's history, because history is unchangeable. It happens and we work with what we have created. Even if we didn't know that we are creating it, we work with that to improve tomorrow. How we use history to study and set the future is something I want to start with in this lecture. I know no country without history of resisting wrong forces, either you are resisting wrong forces as a country, um, such as an invasion, or you are a country in formation, and this has happened in the last 1,000 years for many countries that have either become nation states or come together to create a, a territorial entity. So the US Boston Tea Party against taxation without representation, or the Koreans against the Japanese occupation from 1910 till 1945, the Japanese recovery from the 1945 Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs that were dropped by the US, or Uganda against the British, if you know the struggles that we had from about 1944 to 1949 in Katwe, led by Ignatius Musazi and a few other people to try and ensure that Africans too can process you know, raw materials, can process coffee, cotton, tobacco, which was a, a preserve of the Asian community. In Japan, the Meiji, who started governing from around 1850, concluded what they called a treaty of shame because for them to be colonized like any other country is shameful but they used that treaty to take western tools and build their army and drive modernization and started factories they used to call zaibatsus zaibatsus is what south korea eventually adopted and many parts of southeast asia in uganda Instead, we used the treaty of 10th of March 1900, often as a symbol and a search for power parity with the British. Yet, in Article 13 of this Buganda Agreement, or any kingdom after that agreement, that article meant that we lost the right to raise an army, to buy weapons, or to discuss recruitment for defense. Therefore, from where I stand, between March 10th, 1900, and I've said this before, so I want to repeat it today. 1900, March 10th, that morning when that agreement was signed, and the evening of October 9th, 1962, four classes emerged in Uganda. The first class, sons of chiefs and priests, sons of chiefs and priests. They got education, they formed the first core of the public service, they made the public sector very attractive proposition for parents who would take their children to school. So if you think of people like Frank Kalimzo, whose father was uh, from Rwanda, a fellow called Kanyanduga, I think, who was a prince, he would become our first head of public service and the vice chancellor of Makere. Didn't matter really that he had come from another country, but he came from a royal family since the sons of chiefs and priests were the ones really getting education. He would get education in Uganda and he made a contribution in the country. William Ruetseba was the son of our first priest in Angkore, a fellow called Uningwire, who was ordained in 1916. He would be 
I think the first parliamentary secretary and he was the first president of UPU who would join up with UPC in 1960, 59-60. Milton Obote, son of a chief. Ali Picho, who was killed with Alex Ojera, and I think Joshua Wakoli by Amin in 1972. Zakaria Mungonya, Kawalia Kagwa, who would give us electricity, his um, UEB, we used to call it Uganda Electricity Board. He's the first who negotiated, I think, the start for Owen Falls Dam and generating power, son of, of uh, Apollo Kagwa, Apollo Chironde, and many of these people didn't come from peasant families. Uh. Obote in Lango was called uh, Ojalokome, or the one who sacrifices once himself for the people. So by 1953, Nsam is a training school which was modeled on a school called, called the Jin School in Kenya. Kenya had begun that school in 1925. This school in Nsam was taking in uh, young people to become Gomorrah chiefs, Miruka chiefs, and judicial officers. Eh? So if you're not a son of a chief, no school, no education. Because the chief was everything. He was your tax collector, he was your judicial officer, he was your administrative officer, and he had powers in consultation with the colonial government to deal with you however way he wanted. Now, we carried this all through until 1986. So remember schools like King's College Budo, Obudo Urunji, near Nagalavi coronation site here near Kampala. Schools like Mbarara High School, which began in 1911. St. Mary's Chisubi in 1906. Namiriango College in 1902. Gayaza Girls School in 1905. Mengo SS, 1895. Chitovu Secondary School, 1922. These schools were set up by the churches in response to the need to teach sons or daughters, until Gayaza maybe, sons of chiefs and sons of priests. This, the, the institution of a chief was kept until 1986 when resistance councils were introduced. So this was the first group of people, the first uh, group of our society that emerged from that, that agreement in those 68 years, 1900 to 1962. The second group was an army from the north and northeastern parts of our country from societies I call acephalous societies, which had only, their loyalty was only to the British. They formed the huge bulk of the King's African Rifles, fighting for the King of England in the Second World War. They didn't promote education for the army. A rifle was the only means of social ascent and finding work. What was the intention of creating a class of those people? It was to divide our people in groups in what would later be an independent Uganda and deny the various tribal groupings from cooperating together to ward off invaders. Huh? So the British could not attract, you know, Buganda, Bunyoro, Ankole, Ame, because these were organized around their kings. They would fight you off. Their loyalty was to the king. Asifera's society is the loyalty really is to, you know, 10 people, Mayumba Kumi, with a headman who has a bow and arrow, and there's no king above them. Uh, the institution of a chief in many parts of, of northern Uganda, I think, uh, paramount chiefs and others is a colonial uh, creation. Eh? In Buganda, for example, that's not to say that there were no kingdoms in the north because we know the Luos. The major set off was at a place called Pubungu, which is in Pakwach, where the Jonam remained, and the majority of the Luos, who eventually become the Langis and the Acholis and the Jopadolas, the set off was from there. So there were kingdoms, but the loyalty wasn't around, built around the king as in the southern groups. In Buganda, the commander in chief was the Kabaka. Finance minister was Omwanika. The prime minister, as you know, Katikiro. The army commander was called Umuyasi, and the head of the navy was called Gabunga. This was the first, second class that emerged in those 68 years. The third class was the private sector, very small private sector, largely composed of migrant communities, Asians and Arabs. Huh? 
disallowing the growth of entrepreneurship and the business class that would set the rules and challenge the British to their industrial supremacy. The British wouldn't allow that because mercantile imperial countries would never allow peripheral, what, how, that's how they used to call us, peripheral dependent communities in the colonies. They were not allowed to produce what the metropolitan London and all those colonizers were producing. Yeah? I just want you to go and study the work of Sashi Tarul, uh, an author about the story of India. He will explain what metropolitan and the dependencies means. Huh? This disallowing of indigenous entrepreneurs was the cause of Ignatius Musazi's 1945-49 to disturbances that I mentioned in the way. Fortunately, these riots brought about a new level of political consciousness that would lead to the formation of new parties. So Uganda National Congress in 1954, UPC in 1959, and many others. Yeah? The final class number four was a massive population of peasants who composed more than 96% by 1969 when Obote was preparing the Common Man's Charter. Strangely, in Ankole, the 1969 move to the left, what Obote called the Common Man's Charter, in Ankole they called it Common Man Ne Charter, meaning he's a bastard. He's, the common Man doesn't make sense to government. For me, that when I remember that, it's the best expression of the time of how those other four, no, three categories of people looked at the the 96% of the country, so the 4% and the 96%, how they viewed each other. These pronouncements, as we know, they nationalized private investments. There was no education for these peasants, no medicine, no industry, and therefore for many people in the category of 96, you followed your goat or your cow or your shamba, and wherever you sleep, you go to the bush, you cut a tree, you make a bed, that's it, that's your life. You don't know whether it's January or December. My parents were like that until they met the East African Christian Revival Movement and changed. They had been condemned to a life of no production, no market. We still face it today, that's why some of us work so hard to bring many more people into the earning bracket. So, there was a shaky social contract, therefore, that led us to 1962 constitutional guarantees. That social contract began fraying when Obote carried out a referendum, as the Constitution demanded. In 1964, he carried out a referendum of the Lost Counties. Many of you know this story of Biagan Gangesi. So for the first time, after this referendum, the sons of chiefs and loyalty were on a collision course. The question of the time was, will you work together, given both UPC and KY had been brought together by sons of chiefs, and priests, and loyalty. So you remember Ilinjira and Kavaka Mutesa were both royals. So the question was, will you work together or you will split under pressure of running a new state structure you were not used to when the British were there? That question was not answered and the first test to this consensus came on January 25th, 1964. 250 soldiers of the new army, the Uganda army, there was a mutiny in Jinja. They arrested the Minister of Defense, Felix Onama. The British small contingent had to be sent in to intervene to arrest the situation. January 1964. Please mark those dates. 25th of January 1966, it got worse. Daudio Cheng prepared a motion to remove Obote, Felix Onama, Idi Amin from Parliament. Now, the first steps after Daudio Cheng's motion, the first steps of the uneducated army to be called into politics began. So if you want to plot Uganda's constitutional crisis, you need to mark it there. Because what would have been a constitutional crisis where people sit across the table and have a negotiation, have a conversation, we pulled in a very uneducated colonial army, and on February 24th, 1966, Obote suspended the constitution, relieved the Kavaka of the presidency. Now, on May 20th, 1966, Chief Lutaya of Singo, 
and another chief called Lameka Sevanachita of Chagwe, they moved a motion in the Ruchiko asking the central government to remove itself from the soil of Buganda. Immediately, they handed Obote a stick to deal with what had been agreed upon in 1962 as a consensus to build this small country and get these social classes working together. On May, 9, uh, May 24th, 1966, as many of you might know watching me, who are Ugandans, the attack on Olubiri ended the alliance of the sons of chiefs and loyalty and introduced a new element, the army, into what was a purely constitutional negotiation. So if the army is still dominant in our politics, that's, that's we have not resolved the last 60 years of this. Huh? We have not built stronger social classes to really ask the questions and work through policies independent. If I don't want to forget this. This is why really by the year 2005, many of you watching me might have been born. By 2005, my daughter was born, our second child. The UPDF Act was passed, removing the army from active participation in politics. They were responding to a situation that had uh, caused the fraying of the consensus of 1962. Now, on January 25th, 1970, with the murder of Brigadier Pierino Okoya, who was the commander of the 2nd Infantry Brigade, murdered by Idi Amin, Okoya and his wife, found murdered in Gulu, nationalization had, was taking a pace, the army now was so confident that the power they had tested, a little test in 1966, could be fully taken and put to use by themselves. On January 25, 1971, the army eventually overthrew everything. The sons of chiefs destroyed the enclave economy that there was, and we began the descent into a Uganda in which I grew up. Because by the time I went to primary four, Uganda's economy had a negative 14% growth. I remember my own parents struggling to find soap, paraffin, sugar, and uh, there would be a lineup every Friday at the market, an announcement of when soap is coming. Eh? So for you to join politics or do anything after 1979 in the country, you had one route, the army. Many of you who must have listened to President Museveni's uh, you know, messages and clips in 1985, he would say, I was an intellectual, I was never a soldier. I was forced to become a soldier because there was no other way. I needed to defend our people because the gun needed to be learned. If that was the only way, anybody would think they would govern Uganda. So to rebuild, therefore, young people of the 70s and 80s had to do three things. The first one, they had to build a political movement to build a particular level of consciousness encompassing sons and daughters of chiefs, unite them with sons and daughters of priests and sons and daughters of peasants. And Ugandans, irrespective of tribe, irrespective of class, irrespective of religion. You know, this was a fantastic example I can never forget. To know that Sheikh Badru Kakunguru, who in the elections of 1961 told of anybody voting DP as voting for Haram, that's how bad it, it was, because in, in Prince Badru Kakunguru's mind, the Catholic schools were encouraging conversion of children from Islamic families, so he did not like at all DP because it was aligned with the Catholic Church. So to have Prince Badru Kakunguru in the 80s work very closely with Cardinal Subuga, who was the head of the Catholic Church, supporting a rebellion in based in, in the center of the country, led by someone of another religion, to be able to bring religions and tribes and focus on a cause. And that cause is what really built a political movement. 
they built a political movement, they did the second thing. Out of the political movement, they built an army out of this illiterate population. They insisted on education inside the army, ideological education, but also attracting graduates into the army so that the country can defend itself against internal and external threats. And so there is a gentleman I met recently whose example really shocked me. He served Idi Amin, served the second Obote government, has served Tito Kelo, and has since served President Seven since 1986. I have been told, watch the scenario where soldiers in the mid-1980s eh, went and had a drink somewhere down in Entevate pub and they didn't pay. And the owner of the pub insisted on paying and the soldiers went to the barracks, picked their rifles and they came and shot people, including the bar owner, and left. That level of impunity, to know that you could build an army out of this kind of impunity, it meant that you needed to create a political movement and create an ideological cause for people to follow. So if you build a political movement, when you build a political movement and it gives you the strength of the army, the third thing that this young group of the 70s and 80s did was to build an economy that raises all the boats from the bottom, pyramid up, basing it on science, innovation and enterprise, which we are working on today. So where Google's work today is to take a strand of that third leg called economy and now make it stronger through exports, through innovation, through a new approach to the markets. Huh? Thank you and have a great weekend. I'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at tapmedia.com and visit our website at www.tapmedia.com. You can also visit our offices located at Tomosi Business Park, Luzira, Port Bell Road, or call 0414-220-702. Thank you.